Hello everyone, I am happy to welcome you to yet another session of the NPTEL course The History of English Language and Literature. In today's lecture, we take a look at the genre of drama in the age of Romanticism. You may have already figured out that this was not really the age of drama and the focus was mostly on romantic poetry and also some bit of discussion do happen in the field of novel as well. In the case of drama, it needs to be pointed out right at the outset that this was not the period's best known genre. In fact, we do not find any of the romantic tenets penetrating into this genre and revolutionizing drama like it did the other genres such as poetry or novel. But at the same time, though the output in term, of, in term of drama was quite disappointing, we need not turn our faces away from the fact that there is enough material of considerable interest. What makes the dramatic output of this period quite significant is the fact that there is no direct impact of romanticism on this, but at the same time, we do find a certain kind of reflection of the social unrest and also the larger sociopolitical uh, reality is getting reflected in this genre. And in any age, when we say that this is not a particular uh, uh, this is not an age which particularly encouraged any form of uh, genre, it does not mean that the genre was completely absent. It is the same case with drama in the romantic age, we begin to notice that though the output was very limited, there is enough material for us to take a look at and also to see how this genre, though it did not grow directly, it led to the indirect growth of literary criticism in general. As we have been noticing from the beginning of our discussions on Romanticism, this was an age of revolution, particularly French revolution began to dictate the ways in which even literary imagination was getting shaped. And keeping in tune with the spirit of the revolution, we do notice that there were a number of plays with political import which drew a lot of crowds and needless to say this was also a source of anxiety for the rulers uh, even within Britain. And English monarchy and uh, government, particularly the kind of uh, leaders such as Burke who also had written much against the French revolution. They were also quite anxious about the kind of uh, events which happened in France getting replicated in Britain. In fact, we do find that a conservative reaction had already begun to set in uh, the early 19th century and we also noticed how there was a growing unrest about this uh, uh, complacency which was getting dominated by the mid 19th century. But altogether, it may suffice to say at this introduction that this anxiety about the French Revolution had a very positive output. It led to the development of a particular kind of drama known as the revolutionary drama. Even when we begin to address this particular drama as revolutionary drama, it is very useful to recall that there is no particular genre which could be identified as revolutionary drama. But however, this is a convenient phrasing for us to be able to club together the various kinds of uh, dramatic output which was happening, which was mostly imitative in nature, which was also not of supreme genius, but also in a certain way responding to the revolutionary spirit of the period. Significantly, most of the romantic poets, they all tried their hands and drama, particularly in verse, but however, none of them were really successful on stage. And so, in that sense, when we, dis when we begin discussing drama during the Romantic age, it is in stark contrast with the kind of drama which existed in the previous ages. In the previous period, particularly during the Elizabethan times and the times that followed, drama always was meant to be staged. The playwright always wrote with an eye on the stage and with an eye on the audience. But in this period, we notice that it was mostly a game of pen and paper. We do not even find these writers trying to get any of these uh, plays staged. And even when they could get them staged, they hardly drew any crowds because it was more uh, literary than uh, uh, entertainment oriented. So, talking about some of the romantic writers who attempted their hand at drama, the foremost is Shelley, whose Chenchi was set in 16th century Rome. And there is also Col Col Coleridge Osario, which was set in 16th century Spain. Shelley wrote another play, Charles I, which was set in 17th century. It was also quite political in nature. It in fact engaged with the tragedy of the monarchy's downfall and it was set in the civil war period. And he also focused more on the issue of taxation without the consent of the parliament. If you remember, most of these things in terms of the political and social history we had already taken a look at in one of the previous sessions. Though Shelley was not making any direct comparison or even a mention of France, one could see that he was actually drawing parallels between uh, Louis XIV of, of France and the British monarch. So, this, in, this also acted as a kind of warning to the uh, authorities within uh, England. And Coleridge and Sade together had produced the fall of Robespierre in 1794, which also was an offshoot of the French Revolution. 
Among all these sports, it is important to note that Byron was the most successful one as a playwright and his uh, Marino Filairo was a political play set in medieval Venice. It was produced in 1821. And most of Byron's plays, in fact, reached the stage only after his death in the 1930s. There was also this particular uh, poet, John St. John, who produced a particular play, The Island of St. Marguerite, in 1789. But however, this work was censored because of a scene where a mob bursts into a revolutionary song. So this is also an indication that the censorship was quite in place and the government and the authorities always took enough care to completely erase all, everything that would provoke the audience to any kind of unrest. And uh, it's also significant that most of the plays, in order to escape the censorship which was prevalent during those times, they used to situate their plays and their themes in different locations and also uh, also place them in different time spans which were quite distant from their contemporary period. Which is why we find most of these plays getting uh, set in distant lands in, uh, in, in places where Britain do not have anything to do with. William Godwin's Faulkner published in 1807 and also the translation of Schiller's The Robbers, uh, the translator was Alexander Teitler in 1792. These were major influences in bringing political discussions into the uh, foray of drama. And C.M. Whelan's Dialogue of the Gods was published by Joseph Johnson in 1795. It's useful to recall again that Joseph Johnson was a radical publisher who encouraged a lot of taboo material to be uh, published and he was also associated with Mary Wollstonecraft and encouraged the publication of a lot of women writers. It's said that C.M. Whelan's Dialogue of the Gods was inspired majorly by Shelley's Hellas and Prometheus Unbound. So though indirectly we do find a certain kind of romantic tendency uh, seeping into this, these uh, dramatic outputs as well. Charles Lamb, though he was mostly an essayist and though his uh, claim to fame also rests on the kind of uh, humorous essays that he wrote, his John Woodwell was staged in 1800 and it was published in 1802. His play was set in the immediate years after restoration. We do see that Lamb also takes sufficient care to distance himself from the immediate uh, uh, political realities. Charles I was a play written by Mary Russell Mitford. It was initially banned in 1825, but eventually she could stage it, but in an unlicensed theatre in 1834. It's useful also to remember that there were only two proper licensed theatres in uh, London during that time. And this work, Charles I by Mary Mitford, it portrays Oliver Cromwell as a potential Democrat, though a failed one. And her work also suggests a sympathy for the Puritan and parliamentary cause, so it did not really go down well with the authorities and it had mixed responses as far as its audience reaction was concerned. The writer named Sadler Wells engaged with a lot of historical battles in his plays. Two of the prominent ones were the Battle of Trafalgar, published in 1806, and the Battle of Nile, published in 1815. So in a certain way, we begin to notice again and again that the playwrights were writing not for the stage but for an audience who were reading them. So in that sense we also see a transition of uh, the genre of drama from a performance oriented genre towards a more literary genre. Amidst all this censorship and amidst all the anxiety of uh, an impending revolution, we do find that a number of them wrote direct political satires as well. When we say direct we also need to remember that it was in some uh, way or the other. Uh, safely located so as not to come under any kind of violent censorship. One of the most important plays of this time which employed the method of direct censorship was published in 1817 by R.S. It was titled The Bugaboo. Because of the initials R.S. it was mistakenly and also deliberately attributed to Robert Sade uh, so that he would also perhaps run into some kind of a political tussle with the reigning authorities. And this work had several attacks on the government in comical verse, but it remains quite uh, uh, anonymous who this R.S. really was. And Robert Sade himself, he wrote a, a play titled What Tyler? It was a drama praising the Republican ideals and the revolution. The play incidentally was republished in 1817. But much to Sade's embarrassment, by then his personal choices and his opinions and his political stances had turned had changed much. It was a cause of much political disappointment and embarrassment for him. There was yet another work which was located in a distant land published in 1804 by Joanna Baylis. It was titled Constantil Paleologus and it was about a besieged monarch in ancient times. This sort of not giving a particular location or a particular life uh, time 
also gave more freedom for the playwright to express ideas that could otherwise uh, be considered more uh, problematic as far as uh, the uh, ruling monarch or the ruling authorities were concerned. Elizabeth Inchball's uh, The Massacre was also another significant work. This was actually based on the September massacres of, this, of 1792. This is also an offshoot of the uh, French Revolution and the events that led to it. This play was considered extremely violent. There were a lot of uh, uh, scenes uh, were related to murdering mobs, streets strewn with bodies and dead children. And the play obviously was suppressed due to the kind of violent reaction that it may have provoked had this been staged. So, we do see that in some of the cases, the uh, in, in some of the cases, the authorities do intervene in order to prevent any kind of mob reaction to a particular event or even to a particular staged event. George Watson's England Preserved, published in 1795, was set in the 15th century. Similarly, Samuel Birch, The Adopted Child, again published in 1795, was a play about the attempt to kill an heir to a castle. Wordsworth, the master poet of the Romantic Age, he also wrote a couple of plays titled Borderers and uh, Bailey's de Montfort. It was also about the political themes of the revolution. And this incidentally was also during the early time of his career when he was really impressed and delighted about the prospects of the French Revolution. Taking off from the influence given by the Gothic fiction, we find a melodramatic kind of drama also dominating around this period. It was known as the Gothic melodrama. Perhaps the most important work in this genre was Matthew Monk Lewis' The Castle Spectre, published in 1797, and The Wood Demon in 1807. So, we do find that this is also getting published around this transition phrase from the late 18th century towards the Romantic period. And, um, and similarly, uh, Walter Scott, one of the master storytellers of the Romantic Age, also contributes to the development of this Gothic melodrama through his The Lady of the Lake. It was adapted for stage in 1810. Scott, though he was a novelist, many of his plays were adapted for stage and also all of them had a big successful uh, run as well. And when it came to the staging of the Gothic melodrama, it is useful to remember that they used to employ a lot of innovative stage techniques and they also tried to bring in special effects through the mechanical uh, devices which could be employed uh, at that time. And in that sense, it is also in stark contrast to the earlier kinds of uh, stages which were comparatively less colourful and less eventful. So, in the Gothic melodrama, we also find uh, uh, various kinds of special effects such as people disappearing, storms appearing, the wild sea raging, the scenes uh, with dungeons and demons and also there was a lot of room for a uh, deranged erotic uh, passion to be displayed. So, in that sense, it was also uh, discredited by some of the leading critics of those times and many also thought could be a very uh, misleading influence on the uh, play going public. Edward Fitzpaul was one of the leading uh, playwrights who wrote plays that dealt with a sea and his works were popular in the 1820s and in the 1830s and his major works include The Pilot, The Red Rover, The Wrench and The Reef. Given that it was a time of colonial expansion and that many were taking, uh, uh, many were responding to their passion to go for adventures in the sea, this sort of a play about the sea uh, could only become more successful than ever. This is also the appropriate time to take a look at how the theatre was evolving and developing within London. And though the development of drama was not very promising and though it did not uh, result in any kind of delightful or entertaining uh, response, we find that in terms of theatre, this was a very exciting period in London. We find most of the theatre staging classical and popular plays of the past and mostly Shakespeare was a favourite of all these uh, theatre goers. London theatre at this point of time was dominated by two houses operating under Peyton, Jury Lane and Covent Garden and both were also rebuilt in the 19th century with increased capacity. So, this also had made uh, theatre going as one of the favourite pastimes of uh, people during that time. There were also some famous actors who also became celebrities during their time, namely John Philip Campbell, Sarah Siddons who was the sister of Campbell, Edmund Keane and William Charles McCready. 
Mrs. Siddons or Sara Siddons in fact she gave uh, thrilling performances of tragic women characters. The character that she played of Lady Macbeth was much renowned and many periodicals and the magazines of those times wrote uh, delightfully about it. And uh, Hazlitt who was one of the leading critics of those times and one of the critics who also laid the foundation of the genre of literary criticism was one of the regular contributors of uh, the reviews of the dramas which were getting staged in either of these theatres at that point of time. And most of these, uh, most of these plays being adaptations or reworked versions of Shakespeare, they all had an immense delight to talk about these dramas and give critical and also rave reviews about them. Hazlitt is said to have written at one point, Mr. Keane's Hamlet is as much too splenetic and rash as Mr. Kemble's is too deliberate and formal. So, we find these uh, uh, critics responding not just to the plays but also to the actors who were giving life to these characters on stage. Paul Richard another point is said to have remarked that watching Edmund Keane was like reading Shakespeare by flashes of lightning. So, by the 19th century it was no longer a spectacle to watch uh, men and women on stage and it also became one of the commonplace kind of pastimes that it was no longer important to highlight that both men and women could share a stage in the London theatre. There was also the emergence of a new kind of uh, play such as the sentimental comedy and farce but we do find most of them looking down upon it and especially Wordsworth is said to have remarked that they were sickly and stupid German tragedies and they need to be dismissed altogether from the London scene. As most of these theatres were focusing on the earlier plays of Shakespeare and also the classic and the past plays, uh, we find that there is an acute shortage of uh, new plays. So, because of this very often the dramatization of Scott's uh, novels took place as soon as they appeared on print. And we find Scott also in that sense becoming one of the most favorite of the theatre goers as well as the novel readers of those times. Perhaps the most influential and the foundational influence on drama of the Romantic period was on the evolution of dramatic criticism. One of the important works of this time was Thomas De Quincey's On the Knocking at the Gate in Macbeth. So, this period also in that sense sees the beginning of Shakespeare criticism becoming a more academic and a more literary pursuit. Hazlitt is said to have remarked about Hamlet that there is no play that suffers so much in being transferred to the stage. And around this time, similar to Hazlitt, many other critics also they begin to attempt comparisons between the same play when it is written and also when it gets translated into the stage. Even Charles Lamb was quite doubtful about the performance of King Lear and he feared that the Lear of Shakespeare cannot be acted. The character of Hamlet he continued to be the chief object of meditation for the romantics primarily because they could relate in many ways to the kind of dilemma that Hamlet also went through during his lifetime and they could directly transport all the kind of anxieties and dilemma onto this character as well. And Coleridge himself is said to have remarked that he had a smack on Hamlet uh, myself if I may say so. Hazlitt's The English Comic Writers published in 1819, it defended the Restoration Writers. So, in that sense we do begin to notice that the dramatic, uh, uh, the, the form of criticism of drama begins to uh, develop in a more advanced pace. They also begin to take a look at not just contemporary drama but also begin a, a study of the earlier writers and the earlier uh, dramatic performances as well. Charles Lamb also wrote an influential piece titled On the Artificial Comedy of the Last Century. Here also we find him defending the restoration comedy from the uh, condemnation of an over earnest age. It is also useful here to remember that restoration comedy and restoration drama in general when it was staged was considered as a source of immorality and also was uh, uh, forced to close down because of the uh, uh, licensing act which came at a later point of time. And at this point of time it becomes uh, almost important for all of these writers to take a look at whatever has passed before them and also they find it quite important to highlight these uh, past kind of performances and also talk about them in a critical and a more uh, insightful manner. So, overall it would perhaps suffice to say that though there is no significant uh, uh, direct relation that we can find between the growth of romanticism and the growth of drama, this period certainly laid a market foundation on the growth of the literary criticism of drama. So, with this we begin to wrap up this lecture. Thank you for listening and look forward to seeing you in the next session.